Buenas noches. Or, and good afternoon. I always like to begin speaking in the first European language that was spoken in present day United States, which of course is in Espanol. Um, my formal education was, has been talked about a little bit, but my best teacher was my grandmother, my abuela. And it was my abuela, my grandmother, um, who before I interviewed in 1975, started telling me stories about uh, her living in different parts of the United States because she had 12 children and of those 12 children uh, they were born in the state of Colorado, in Texas, in Illinois, and then five of them were born in Mexico. And how did I learn about it? It wasn't because she started telling me the stories but because I started asking her questions. <laughs> And a lot of times when I come to presentations like this, there are people in the audience who are kind enough afterwards to talk a little bit more, and it's maybe like a father and a son. And then the son is standing right by his father, and the father's telling me, yeah, he said, when I grew up, we had this in the boxcar, and, and then he turns to his father and says, Dad, you never asked me this. And he goes, you never asked, you know? <laughs> Why do I begin by saying that? Because it's important for family history to be done by asking these sort of questions, so I encourage you all to do that. What I'm providing here today is my historical interpretation based on a lot of primary materials that I have personally sought out by interviewing individuals who lived in boxcars or whose family members lived in boxcars, actually went to the sites where the boxcars were located and have traveled to places like um, the State Archives for the State of Kansas in Topeka, I've gone to Missouri, I've gone to a lot of historical societies in the local area, oftentimes going in and they say, well, I've been here in this historical society, this museum for 25 years, and I can tell you there weren't any Mexicans in this area, or there weren't any boxcars, but I persist and I look and if I find two, three photographs, um, I, I believe I've succeeded. So what you're looking at today is a product of about five, six years of research and uh, with the grace of God and some more money, I'm going to be converted this into a, a video, maybe within about a year or two. But I'd like to get back to the whole point about uh, interpretation and a point of perspective. And it reminds me this one little story about this old man, this, this viejito, who uh, lived along the border. And one day, I, an American couple with a young a uh, boy crossed into the border, into Mexico, and they were walking around this rural area, and uh, they happened upon a ranch, and in this rancho, they had some horses, and the little boy, of course, wanted to ride on the horse. And so he went up to the owner of the horses, this old man, this viejito, and he told him, he says, I want to ride, rent your horses. And the viejito looked at him, the old man, he says, he no look too good. And the American says, no, no, he looks fine. He says, I'll pay you so much money so the little boy could ride the horse. And the old man said, no, 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 no. He no look too good. Well, the American persisted, gave him like 5,000 pesos, like $2 American money. And he ran to the horse. The little boy got on the horse, drives into the wood, rides into the wood area. Horse runs right into a big tree. Boom. American gets all upset and he says, you, you, you rented me a horse that's blind. And the old man said, I told you that he, had, he no look too good. <laughs> <laughs> History is very similar. It's based on interpretation, perspective, understanding, or oftentimes misunderstandings. And so it's not unusual for people who may not be aware of the history of Mexicans in the United States. I've been fortunate enough to have lived in Texas and in California uh, and in New York City. And in all those places, I would arrive and people would say, including other graduates, and they go, are there Mexicans in Chicago? And I, <laughs> and I would say, yeah, in my family, there's gotta be several thousand just to start with. <laughs> and they go, no, really? And I would say, yeah, my grandson, who's eight years old, when I took him to Mexico, he would say, ah, Grandpa, this is really pretty over here, the beaches and everything, muy bonito. 
He says, but there's a lot of Mexicans, but in Chicago, there's more Mexicans than in Mexico, okay? Now, in terms of interviewing people, it's also my job not to correct people's interpretations, but to put them within context, and then I do the fact checking. For example, I've interviewed people back in the 1980s and 1980s, I mean 1990s, and they would say, well, we were in Chicago on this street in the 1940s, and I can guarantee you, we were the first Mexicans in that neighborhood. There was no Mexicans before that. I've already read literature that said there was Mexicans before that. And then I've interviewed people who said, no, no, we were the first ones. In the 1930s, on Aberdeen Street, Roosevelt, we were, there was no other Mexicans. We were the first ones. I said, okay, I'm not going to correct them. I can hear my grandmother saying, no, 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 no. You can't tell them, <laughs> especially these older folks. But one day, around nine years ago, eight years ago, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of interviewing a man by the name of Don Zenobio. You'll see a picture of him. And I walked into his house and um, made an appointment to interview him and knocked on the door, and the guy answered. He spoke in English. I thought it was a little unusual. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm here to talk about the railroad boxcars. And I said, are you Sinovio? He goes, yeah, I'm Sinny. And I go, Sinovio? Yeah, that's what everybody calls me. And he said, oh, he says, you're the guy that wants to know about the box. He says, I was born in boxcar number 59, and he porks to a picture on the wall. And I go, and so you're not from Mexico? He goes, oh, he says, you want to talk to my father. <laughs> Dad was 103 when I interviewed him. Wow. And when Don Zenobia told me that he was the first Mexican to work in Aurora, I believed him. Okay. Okay. So now we have some good idea that we're talking about a history that goes back almost 100 years. So with those type of beginnings, I'll, my style is that I have um, a presentation largely based on chronology. If you have questions, you don't have to answer to the end. If you have a comment, you could shoot it out. If you disagree, that's fine. My honorarium doesn't change, okay? <laughs> and so this is a presentation on the early Mexican communities in railroad boxcar housing. I want to thank Naperville uh, Settlement for inviting me. So Mexicans lived in boxcars. So what? What does that mean? Well, within a local, regional, and national contents, railroads are very important. We all know that Chicago is a railroad hub of the United States and didn't lose its importance until the age of uh, large use of commercial airlines in the late 1950s and the 1960s. So railroads, of course, are the engine uh, for economic development and growth. Uh, they're vital to commerce and for, of course, transportation. Uh, for freight and passenger uh, service. What is my goal and my time focus? Well, I want to acknowledge, honor, and celebrate the contributions of Mexicans to the development and growth of Chicago and the Midwest. Is there a social message? Is there a political message in here? Yes, there is. I believe that oftentimes all you hear is negative things about uh, Mexican communities and negative things about immigrants. This is a story about an immigrant population that, it, that is now part and parcel of American society. And so it's very important to point out these positive contributions. Now, my time focus begins in the 1910s and ends in the 1960s, which is roughly about the time when you saw the last of boxcars uh, in the Midwest. First question, why did Mexicans immigrate to the United States? And it was one of the things that my grandson, his name is uh, Julian, uh, would ask me, you know, uh, and, and try to figure out if they're Mexican or if they're American. When I use the term Mexican, I use it to identify people by culture and by ethnicity. If I say Mexicans and identify them having been born in Mexico, then I will say Mexicans from Mexico as opposed to Mexicans in the United States. Or like my grandson Julian liked to say, yeah, Grandpa, I know. You're from Mexico. You're like a real Mexican. Okay? Okay? So, so when I identify it, I may be saying Mexicans of people who have already been here three, four generations, which is not unusual to have that many generations working for big railroad companies 
uh, in the United States. So why did they come here? Two basic factors. Well, in 1910, there was a big Mexican Revolution, which was uh, comparable to the Russian Revolution in terms of uh, great upheaval, uh, violence, and uh, military battles throughout the country. It created an unstable government. Uh, there were leaders in control that frequently changed and evolved along and a bitter civil war. But it wasn't just the violence that was occurring in Mexico, it's more the consequences. The consequences of the Mexican Revolution in which over two million people died and you had this great up, uh, social upheaval, it created economic chaos. What does that mean? It means to uh, common people that there's no jobs, it's hard work to live at, and you don't wanna have one of your young uh, male children be conscript conscripted during the middle of the night and taken off to fight on the other side. And this created conditions for immigration to the United States. And in the vernacular of immigration historians, it's basically a, a push move. I'm not suggesting that these two uh, factors are the only ones because immigration is highly complex and there's many, many reasons behind it. But for the purpose of this presentation, I want to point out these two very obvious and important roles. Well, one of the reasons that people were able to come all the way from Mexico to Chicago was that there was an existing railroad network that didn't end at the border, whether it was El Paso, Texas, or Laredo, or in Juarez, or uh, even in San Diego, San Isidro, and, and, and Tijuana. These railroad systems had existed all the way back in, in the 1880s. What does that mean? It means that you may be from a small town in, uh, in the central plateau of Mexico, which would be the, the, the states of Michoacan, Jalisco, and Guanajuato. And you could be a half a day uh, walking distance, two hours by burro, uh, ride to a railroad station. And from there you can end up at the border relatively quickly, get a contract to work in the United States, and be in Chicago in 20, 25 hours. So you had that facility of being able to come into the country uh, through these railroad uh, companies. So down here towards uh, the bottom area uh, is the central plateau where the majority of Mexican workers uh, came to the Midwest through the 1920s. Over here is the town of Monterrey, which is this retired guy that grows bananas in, in the Caribbean and tells bad jokes, was born in. <laughs> Okay, coming to the United States up until the late 1920s before the Great Depression was a relatively easy thing. It didn't require a lot of paperwork and it certainly didn't require a lot of money. When you got to the border, you had to pay five cents to cross, uh, in this case, into uh, Laredo, Texas, across would be New, Nuevo Laredo and the state of Coahuila. And there was not uh, uh, the intensity or the number of immigration officials along the border of the Border Patrol agents. So earlier I talked about the, uh, the majority of Mexicans that came from, that arrived in Chicago, came from the states of Guanajuato, Jalisco, and Michoacan, and where the dotted areas in cent in, uh, that are in the center of uh, the Republic of Mexico is where those areas are at. And they came, in many cases, uh, to Chicago or knew where they were arriving. Because immigration isn't a, a, a question of one day, you know, Pa wakes up and says, hey, Maria, you want to go to the United States? You know, no. People know where they're going to go. In most cases, because there's already a job waiting for them, they know where to get the housing. And in many cases, they already have their father or grandfather already there. They're going directly from one particular place in Mexico directly to a place in the United States. Okay, and why immigrate to select areas in the United States? Why did they end up in Chicago? Chicago has always held the second largest Mexican population in the, 19, in, in, in the United States since the 1920s. The only one that has more is Los Angeles. And Los Angeles has the third largest population of Mexicans in both the United States and Mexico. So within a Pan-American context, for example, Chicago has more Mexicans 
based on the, the census of the year uh, 2000. Then the city of Leon, Guanajuato. And Leon, Guanajuato has 500,000 people. And so within the metro area, you have more Mexicans in the Chicago area than you do in a major city uh, in Mexico. So why did they come here? Well, they came because there was a labor shortage. And that labor shortage in the United States and, and places like Chicago was exacerbated because during World War I and later on in II, there was intensive shortage. So people came for the jobs. It wasn't the winter weather, okay? <laughs> So specifically, how did they end up working, say, for railroad companies? When people arrived at the border, you had these railroad recruiters, uh, labor recruiters. They were called ingachistas, which means the hooked ones. And they were labor contractors. And they would be at the border. Oftentimes, they would actually go into the interior of Mexico, violating, of course, zillion laws. And some people may call them undocumented Americans going into Mexico because they had no business <laughs> conducting that, which is very true. So they went in there because there was cheap and available labor. So they signed a contract, and the contract then gave them assurance of a, a job being there waiting for them. Okay, so in addition to uh, the laborers being along the border and going into Mexico, you had local newspapers, and this is an ad from a Spanish language newspaper in Chicago. And this is from around 1922. And the ad says that they need Mexican workers, Mexican workers, trabajadores, with families, okay? The early Mexican immigrants that came uh, were largely uh, what were called solos, men that came by themselves. Well, Mexican men in particular, like a lot of men, don't want to be in a place without female company, without their wife, without mama, grandma. So they, they, they encourage them to come with their entire families. From the economic end, the employers did that because it provided greater stability. It assured them they would stay in their jobs a long period of time. So it says that uh, to work for the Burlington Railroad, in section houses, and in camps. And what do you get in return? For housing, you get a carro, a car. You get a stove, and you get coal, okay? Free coal. And that you also have space to, to have some gardening. So this is a recruitment uh, example here in the United States, in Chicago, newspaper. And their ads are saying that you can go to Kansas, Nebraska, Denver, or St. Louis, and all these places you can apply to get a job for the Burlington Railroad. And that's just one railroad company, okay? This is giving an example of the type of railroads, um, engines that were used during the period of time during the high peak of the boxcar uh, era, which was the 1920s and, and early 1930s. This is a photo of Santa Fe Railroad track workers somewhere near western Illinois. Probably came out of Galesburg, near the Mississippi River. And this is a Mexican crew. These are railroad laborers in Galesburg, uh, Illinois, in 1920. When I talk about railroad workers during that period of time, some of the railroad companies had as many as 40, 50, 60 percent of their maintenance away. What does that mean? Maintenance away were the, were the general laborers. They didn't work um, as railroad switchmen. They didn't work in the roundhouse. Uh, they didn't, certainly didn't have an administrative job. They were the laborers. And it wasn't until like the 1960s that you started seeing some upward mobility into those good and better paying jobs. This is a map of uh, Chicago and the Midwest. And I would argue, along any of those trunk lines, you would find a boxcar communities largely with, with Mexicans. Because in the turn of the century, you had other immigrants. But by the 1920s, they were largely uh, Mexicans uh, inhabiting these boxcars. And when I say a community, the community could be two boxcars, and it, or it could be as many as 100, 150 boxcars. In the Chicago area, there were 
over 2,000 uh, residents living in boxcars during the 1920s. Okay. So here's a boxcar colony near Pekin, Illinois, and there were 183 Mexican families living there in 1913. And you could see how these are lined up on railroad tracks, which was not always the case. The boxcar oftentimes were taken off of uh, the wheels and put on grounds, and a variety of different things done to them. Some of them were rented, some of them were, were so-called sold, uh, some of them were part of your, your contract for, for employment, so you, you got, quote, free housing. This is a map of 1927, 1928, of 20 railroad camps that were in the Chicago area, in Cook County and DuPage. On the far south end, it would be places like Blue Island, uh, Illinois, and on the western side, it would be including places in Cicero and Berwyn, over in, in places like Oak Brook, and as you go out further west, in Aurora and to Lamont area. Again, wherever you've had um, need for maintenance of way workers, and remember, Chicago is the railroad capital of the world, of the United States, you would find these boxcars. And this is the one that had like 2,000 people all together in the 1920s. Okay. This is from uh, scenes of a boxcar in the Proviso uh, camp, uh, which is around Mannheim Road uh, and current uh, Eisenhower Expressway. And I begin to point this out because yes, they encourage families to come and so you had uh, families with the moms and children that were born. And when I say children, these are no longer like my grandson would say, Grandpa, they're not Mexican, they're Chicagoans, they're Americans, okay? So these are American children, okay? And these are American children uh, born to Mexican immigrants. And you could see on the right-hand side a couple of boxcars uh, with the windows. And, uh, and this is one from the Rock Island camp. So the ads don't say that you get indoor plumbing because the boxcars were never made nor intended for human habitation. So they are, on the left-hand side, that's uh, an outhouse. On the right-hand side, they provide an area where people can have chicken coops to raise chickens. Okay. The little reporting, public reporting, regarding boxcar communities oftentimes uh, were negative and sensational. This is an ad, I mean, a, a reporting from a newspaper in, in Blue Island, Illinois, uh, on the south side in 1916, where there's a lot of concern about Mexicans living in these boxcars in bad conditions, but the real focus is, is that there's prostitutes coming into the area, there's bad plumbing, the housing is horrible, and that uh, it, it should not be allowed to exist. It doesn't point to the finger to those that created the conditions that you know people living in boxcar. There's no uh, plumbing. There's no electricity. There's no uh, real heating. But they point it to the victims. So again, I, I point this out to try to give some balance and, and, and point out well, what we know about them from 102 years ago, it was largely negative uh, reporting. Okay, uh, here's a boxcar. Colonia, okay, from uh, I think it's 1927, and this is uh, near Aurora. It's uh, near the unincorporated area of Eola, it doesn't exist anymore. And this one had about 120 something uh, families, very large uh, uh, colony. And when we talk about where the railroad camps are, you can see that they're off the, car, off the wheels, and that's how close they are to the, to the tracks. It's not a very safe place to be. And the noise and the dirt and so forth uh, must have been uh, horrific, okay? You had a lot of children. So this is really your first generation of Mexican-American uh, citizens in the Chicagoland uh, area uh, whose parents came from Mexico, okay? And I also want to, you know, some people point out, you know, the kids don't have shoes and, you know, that they're kind of unkempt. But one of the things I've always been amazed about in terms of resiliency of a lot of these people 
is that when I've interviewed them, they never say things like, we were poor. They say things like, we didn't know we were poor until we went to high school, you know? <laughs> and it, it's a common thread. And people say we were happy, and we know that it was really crowded, because the boxcars uh, oftentimes had multiple families. So you had grandma and grandpa, who were the first ones there, and then after a few years, their son came, and then their son brought their daughter, and of course, they have kids, and then you baptize them, and you have compadres, you have the godparents, and you have the next door neighbor, and you know, so they're all pretty crowded, all, all in there. Boxcar communities reflect the culture of its inhabitants. So people, yes, lived there for housing, but they also celebrated uh, different types of religious activities and things you would find in any other community. So you had uh, baptismals, for example. And this is a baptismal from uh, the Blue Island uh, camp on the far south side. And so this is the late 1920s. Uh, you can see the women are dressed with flappers. It shows some level of economic uh, mobility and ability to buy uh, this type of, of dress. But it is trickle-down economics, make no doubt about that. Uh, but they are moving their way up and they do have these type of celebrations in the camps. You also had funerals uh, in boxcar uh, communities. Okay, people lived, were born there, and people died there. And people were injured there. The young man on the, on the far left side, when I went down to Galesburg and interviewed the people there, they pointed out that this young man had been playing in his front yard, 100 feet from the railroad tracks, with freight moving all the time. Okay? So these sort of things happen uh, all the time. And again, what I'm trying to point out, that there was also a cultural life uh, in the area. When I say boxcar, you know, how big are we really talking about? Okay? So the boxcar was about eight and a half feet wide, 36 feet in length, total square foot was 306. If you compare it to a semi-truck trailer, uh, it's not as big as that. And I've been fortunate to live in Manhattan, and this is still smaller than a Manhattan apartment. Okay? <laughs> so this is tiny. And remember, you have families in there, and you have uh, beds, and you, you probably have a sheet or a bed to separate uh, one couple from another, and you have children, so it's uh, very, very crowded. Okay. Once in a while, you may find a boxcar. And I was in central uh, Kansas, in Wellington, Kansas, in four years ago. And someone told me, oh yeah, my great grandfather, he has one. He has it in his backyard. I go, in his backyard? He goes, yeah. And I go, he can't have it in his backyard. He does. Grandpa had it in the backyard. And you could see it there. That's a boxcar. And they recycled it and they use it as a shed. I had to had that photograph taken very quickly before the local police called <laughs> to find out what's a real Mexican doing in Wellington, Kansas. Okay. Okay, so you have 306 square feet of total living space. Never designed, it's never been built or intended for human habitation. No indoor plumbing electricity, and you only have a, a curtain to partition the area into two separate rooms. You know. So yeah, do I believe when people said they enjoyed living there and, and they were happy? Yes, it doesn't change the reality of the physical structure and, and what it was like to live, because people said that during the winter that it was very, very frío. And I was like, yeah, you know, viejito, it's time to go back to Mexico, you know? And uh, so uh, it, it was difficult living there. This is Don Cenobio, the, the, uh, the man I interviewed in Aurora when he was 103 years old, and he's the one that uh, told me that he was one of the first ones that arrived in the Aurora area. Uh, to live there. And the little, uh, the child in the front is the man that I met uh, who was born in a boxcar and has a picture on the wall. Doesn't have a picture with a stork, doesn't have a picture in their first house. He has a picture of a boxcar where he was born. Okay. And uh, just some other examples uh, in Eola to point out that, you know, the boxcars varied, just like housing. 
regular housing, the, where they put the windows, where they had a porch, where they had gardens, uh, things like that. In places like Eola and other areas in the United States, what they did is they built their own chapels dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this is in Eola. And the way they did this is that they would get several boxcars, and here's two of them, and then they create their own chapel. So of course, on December the, the 12th, on the day of Our Lady of Guadalupe, they dress up all the children as Indians and, uh, and celebrate and have mass and so forth. So uh, another example of the religious activity that would go on, you would have music. You had music classes that were taught by, in the 1920s, by Spanish priests, okay? And when I say Spanish, I mean from Spain. Why Spain? During the late 1920s, at the tail end of the Mexican Revolution, there was what was called the Cristero Rebellion. And a lot of people believed that it was being anti-church, anti-Catholic. So a lot of those priests that were Spanish in Spain ended up fleeing to the United States, and some of them continued their work with Mexicans, and in this case, teaching Spanish uh, music to the inhabitants of the boxcars, okay? And these are um, mandolins, okay? So it's, it's not mariachi music with the, with the big torolocha and stuff, okay? It's important to point out, you know, it's, uh, how diverse it was. You also had uh, plays that were given in, in the boxcars, you had theater and art. And to me, this begins to tell you that the, the people that came from Mexico to the United States were not all poor, were not all rural, they were not all uneducated. The Mexican Revolution disrupted middle and upper class people. And a lot of those ended up coming to places like Chicago and working in the railroads because they had no other place to work. If you had no English language skills and you can't prove that you had uh, certain credentials or your credentials weren't accepted here, you ended up working with everybody else. So there was a target audience and there was enough people to support theater and art coming even to the boxcars uh, in the 1920s. Mexicans continued to be involved in Mexican government sponsored activities. Uh, this is a ID for uh, an individual who was involved with a group called the Comisión Honorífica Mexicana out of Aurora. And they actually there were several hundred of these commissions that were part of the Mexican consulate. Because the Mexican consulate and the Mexican government felt that a lot of its best people had fled Mexico, okay? And oftentimes the United States, nowadays you talk about the brain drain, you know, you're losing your best people. Same thing with the Mexican governance position. They go, we want these people to eventually come back because now they've learned skills, working in steel mills and meatpacking areas and, and railroad industry. They're bilingual, they have money, we want them back. So they kept them involved. And so it wasn't until like the 1970s that the naturalization rate for Mexicans were very low. <clears throat> and it wasn't until the 1970s that you had a lot more Mexicans applying for citizenships, taking the test, and becoming active in the political process. Locally, why didn't they become United States citizens? And it reminded me one time in, I interviewed a Mexican couple, late 70s, early 80s. You're supposed to separate them, but they were like together. <laughs> so I begin the interview, and interview the, the gentleman first. And I'm asking, how long, well, I've been in, in the United States 54 years. How many children? Uh, 12, 11 are still living. Do you own your home? Yes, I own my home, I'm retired, I get my, uh, my, my pension, my children, you got grandchildren? I think I got 42 grandchildren. And once you're ready to move on to the next part of life, I wanna be buried in Mexico. His wife goes and gives him a shot in the ribs and says, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> and I asked him, you really think you're gonna go because you have your whole life here? And he says, yeah, I want to go. Sociologists call this having a sojourner mentality. 
that you believe that you're going to go, and you don't live your life like you're going to go, but it prevents you from becoming, say, a United States citizen. Because you believe that you're eventually going to go, and why leave? And the phrase is, I'm going to step on, on the Mexican flag by becoming a U.S. citizen. And so, again, these sort of dynamics took place, and it shapes the political process in the 1970s, because before that, most of these uh, Mexicans and their children, not, not their children, but many of these Mexicans, immigrants, have not applied to become United States citizens. They remain, like my grandson Julian says, real Mexicans. <laughs> so, you have this whole question regarding citizenship and why people were reluctant to, to change. Okay, in La Fox, Illinois, uh, going down the corridor, you also had some Mexican uh, boxcar areas. In some cases, they were not all boxcars. A small number of them were actually made out of creosite. They were the, the, the timber, the, the actual timbers. And they're like eight by eights, and they would put them in the ground and make walls out of them, and then make a, a roof out of tin. And, uh, but, but people and families uh, lived in them. Okay, uh, here's a railroad boxcar with a porch, and they have uh, a garden alongside it. <clears throat> this is again in, in La Fox in 1926, uh, and it's largely uh, mainstream uh, Anglo-Americans and uh, only two Mexican kids that lived in the boxcar community but went to school in, in the nearby schools. And, and oftentimes it was uh, at a disadvantage to the kids, and they put them in grades lower. And I, I have uh, a personal experience uh, I arrived with my mom and my two brothers in 1955 to the west side of Chicago and took me to a grammar school and I remember that they gave me some sort of test and I failed it miserably. And of course it was administered uh, orally in English and with picture stuff that I couldn't comprehend and I was in what's now called a uh, classroom for emotionally and mentally handicapped children for about two months. And one day, a Spanish-speaking teacher or woman came in and asked me, what are you doing in here? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and she talked to the teacher, and then I went on to a regular uh, classroom. It's not at all unusual. Uh, the city of Chicago had uh, the, the city treasurer, the city clerk, uh, who's from Puerto Rico. And he had the same experience uh, of being put in, into classes. So uh, it, it's just a teaser of, of the value of, of bilingual education, of, of what happens when you don't have that. OK, you had parties. You had parties in the boxcars, you know, uh, people getting dressed up and uh, having some drinks. And you know, people take pictures in front of their houses, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, you see these sort of things. Uh, this is in, 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 down in Galesburg. They had uh, their own cars, okay? Automobiles were not expensive during that period of time. And some of them built like these little shacks uh, to um, store their, their, their things. Uh, this is the inside of the, the chapel in, in Galesburg of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, this is the children being dressed up for uh, the celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, recreating the, the, uh, the story about uh, Juan Diego and meeting Our Lady Guadalupe and the kids uh, having their picture taken in sandals in December. No socks. I get cold feet. Okay, so uh, again, uh, children were, died in the boxcars communities. Another example of real life uh, going on. Uh, and you had groups that started organizing, having like real uh, dance groups with performances, uh, not only for the boxcar communities, but to visit other areas for independence of Mexico, uh, September 10th, uh, not Cinco de Mayo, which isn't about buying as much Corona beer <laughs> and that you can drink at one time. Uh, you had gardens in some areas, uh, and this is already going into the 1950s, because this is already like the second generation and like a lot of people with their first homes, they begin to, to fix them up and so forth. And then you had some. Uh, 
These are, I believe, in, in Kansas. And they started putting these asbestos uh, siding and have an addition. And by then I was interviewing some people down there who said, yeah, we, we didn't get along with the Morales because the Morales family, they, they thought they were really snooty because they had like a newer box car and everything. <laughs> so you had these sort of same rivalries that you have, who has the nicest house? Or you know, our box car was nicer than, than with the other people, you know, because, uh, no, but really you have, you have an addition on the roof, it's much higher, you could put another bed up there, you know. So you had sports, uh, and you had sp uh, entire sporting leagues. Again, this is a reflection of what's going on in, um, in American society. You have a separation. You have black uh, leagues that are playing black leagues. You have Mexican leagues that are playing Mexican leagues. In Chicago, I have many uncles who played in the Mexican league in, in uh, Grand Park and others that I knew of that played in Aurora. And they only played other Mexican teams. They didn't even play the Puerto Ricans. Okay? The Puerto Ricans had their own uh, leagues. So you had these teams that played uh, baseball, soccer, and basketball. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the box cars, and you can see um, an outhouse as well. Okay. So by the 19 uh, post-World War II period, uh, the Santa Fe Railroad was one that began to change, or saw the need to have to change the housing, that they were getting a lot of complaints from local uh, municipalities, from uh, nursing associations. They used to go around in rural communities and report that, that the housing conditions were horrid, that it, you know, it was ripe for tuberculosis, and so they decided to start to build uh, better housing. And so they built these section houses, okay, for, for, the, for, the, for the laborers. And so uh, I got these in Topeka, Kansas, and these are not single family places, because they had to share the bathrooms, those two bathrooms at the end, and they had showers, which is a, a big progress, because the other ones didn't have any indoor showers. So these have showers, and they're really made for uh, crews, but they use them for, uh, for Mexican families. Um, I thought I had it in here, but I should point out that the, that the blueprints actually said Mexican uh, housing. So it wasn't made for Latinos, it wasn't made, it was made specifically for, uh, for Mexican workers. And in the literature you'll find a lot of defense of the need to keep these workers because they're hardworking, they're loyal, they're dependable, and they come to work. Okay? Again, all positive examples of being vital to the economy and the labor force. Okay, these are boxcar fam families in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Okay? In some cases, they would bring them together. Uh, different configurations, you know, say so you, you begin with one box car, and then your family grows because you have more common, you have two, and in some cases, you would put them in both horizontally and, and widthwise to have the family together. I mean, when they talk about Mexican families being very close, I mean, that's, <laughs> you're not, you need to be real close, okay? Uh, in Iowa, uh, not far from the Mississippi River. As you go west towards Nebraska, you will find boxcar uh, communities. <clears throat> 1920s and economic prosperity and cultural influence, okay? Again, you're, you're being influenced by your parents and grandparents came from Mexico, but you're also being influenced by mainstream society. So it's not unusual that even within boxcars you would see women dressed like the flappers of the 1920s. I mean, it's, it's like uh, the Americanization process is, is going on. For whatever good or bad, uh, it's not a judgment call, but you have these influences going on even in, in the boxcar uh, community uh, areas. You have a, a connection between places like Chicago and Iowa and Chicago and Kansas. And I met families in Kansas who had families in Chicago who worked for the same railroad companies because they would meet people and they become, they get, they get married, but it all evolved around working for the railroads, okay? And the other thing is that 
most of the railroad companies provided you, I think, with two passes a year or something like that, two or three passes, where you can use it to, to ride anywhere that, that the railroad company went. And a lot of people in the Midwest would take the train to Chicago. Why? Because you get real Mexican tortillas, real carnitas, <laughs> real tamales. Now, really, just like Chicago, you, you get anything throughout the world because it's it, the, the produce that comes in. And so people would take the train and spend a weekend in Chicago and buy groceries and go back to their small towns in Kansas, Missouri, uh, and Iowa. And so oftentimes it gets down to a point where s small towns, people that came from small towns in Mexico, from a particular state, from a particular area, congregated in particular towns and areas in Kansas or in Illinois or in Iowa. And it's very similar to the Italians. The Italians had something that was called Campanello. Campanello meant that people that moved from an area in Italy ended, to, ended up cloistering in areas here in Chicago that was within the church bell ringing of the same area. Because even in Chicago, a lot of people identify themselves by, by the parish. Okay? And, and so it was the same phenomenon. Okay? Uh, this is just a, an example of, of what uh, a cartoon, a caricature of, of a boxcar going back to 1914. So they, again, it's over 100 years old. It has a little porch, um, washing the clothes outside, uh, things like that. So, uh, and of course, the stack for the, uh, for the smoke from the, from the coal. Okay? Uh, against some more workers in, in uh, western uh, Kansas. So you had people that kind of mo had upward mobility, and some people had two, three boxcars, and then you had a few of them that had Pullmans, okay? Pullmans are like the Cadillac of railroad passenger cars. <laughs> but some of them ended up in the, you know, time to recycle heap, and uh, I've spoken to people, and they said, ah, it's vivian con millonarios, they live like millionaires in these huge cars because they were wider. I mean, you still have Pullmans that are in service in, in Cuba. They're still in service in Cuba, and you'll find some of these in, in Eastern Europe. And, and they're considered like, it's like a luxury way to travel to be in these, these Pullmans. So uh, you had people that also uh, lived in Pullmans. And you can see as you stretch back, and, and there's a vehicle uh, there. Again, you have mom and you have children and you still have uh, babies. This is already by the early 1950s in, in Kansas. Uh, and you can see some boxcars uh, in the back. By now, it's already second generation in the 1950s. Uh, railroad workers, I interviewed some railroad workers in Newton. <laughs> Very large community. Some of these boxcar communities have names like Huarache, which means like the sandal, okay? And the other one they call La Lupita, and named after Our Lady of Guadalupe, or Maria. I mean, they all have very typical uh, sweet uh, names, you know. Um, and so when I talked to a lot of these railroad workers, their big complaint was that they never got to work in the roundhouse. And like 40% of all the workers, period, were Mexicans. And these are already our uh, second generation railroad workers born in the United States, and they're still doing the same job as uh, their, their parents or, or their grandparents, okay? So early Mexicans were not employed in the roundhouse, and there was always a, a bone of contention and, and a complaint of not being able uh, to work. I pointed out that some of the houses for Mexican workers were made out of creosote, and so these are those ties that people who are into gardening, they warn you, don't use them because they're not good for your daffodils, right? Well, they were used for, for Mexican uh, workers, and the rooms there were 12 by 12s, and uh, no indoor plumbing, they had outhouses, and up to five to six people per person. And when I say 12 by 12, I get that number because uh, architectural sketches were done for them. The railroad company were, were authorized and encouraged to build these for the workers. It's not somebody waking up one day and say, hey, let's build one of these, you know, this free supplies. No, this is something that's sanctioned by policy by the railroad companies. Here we are, erecting Mexican labor houses. Okay. And of course, some of the, uh, the, the verbiage in here, um, 
uh, talks about that uh, Mexican workers are, no, that the, the housing is very cheap but more substantial has been planned uh, and there's efforts to make a, have a better train and, and a, a better class of laborers. And it, it's basically a, a kit on how to put together housing for your Mexican laborers using leftover stuff. So you want to keep the costs down. So there was never any intention to try to make something uh, good or fair or, or balanced for the workers as cheap as possible. Okay. So um, census are done in the United States every 10 years. And in part of my research, I went to this town in, in central Kansas called Newton, Harvey County. And they went to the railroad camps, okay? And uh, on their PO address, as you go down, you could see it says Mexican camp, Mexican camp, Mexican camp. So these are recordings of individuals by the United States Census uh, recording the, of all these people that lived in these camps with their age and the size of their families. So they begin like with two, four, five people, uh, et cetera. I'm sorry. And if I were, I went back and I looked at the next 10 years and the family had two, had now like five or six <laughs> in the same boxcar number and so forth. So there, there was that stability that people stayed there, the more family they had mm -hmm. and, and they had access to get another boxcar, move alongside and they would uh, stay in those area. So this is from 1919, okay. Uh, the one in Newton, uh, they called themselves, the, the area was the ranchito, the little ranch, okay? And people talk about it endearingly, you know? It's like, oh, I lived in the ranchito, it was so nice there, you know? <laughs> My mama loved it there, you know? Okay, another type of housing that was made for Mexican laborers were, were 10 room bunk houses, okay? And they originally were made for, at the far ends were made for uh, the, the foreman and then the laborers were in the center, but they, decided to use these for Mexican families as well. And so the layout is a little bit different. And let me see if we have it here. Okay, so this is uh, what the front of the bunkhouse looks. And uh, again, they're, they're very small, but they were uh, concrete, which is a, a step up. Uh, so oftentimes with, in, in other parts of, of the country, after the railroad camps began to die down and, and they couldn't use the house anymore, they established permanent com communities. And they built their own churches, for example, uh, for Our Lady Guadalupe, and, and this is in 1920. So oftentimes, these are the origins of a lot of long-standing uh, Mexican communities in the United States that began as, as boxcar housing. And again, this is very commonplace to see these uh, uh, examples of using boxcars for making chapels and the role of the Catholic Church being very much involved uh, in assisting uh, Mexican immigrant and their children and being very pro-Americanization in their schooling, uh, the teaching of, of Mexican music and passing on that type of, of culture. Uh, you had basketball teams uh, in these areas. Uh, so I pointed out that a lot of these children were born in railroad boxcars, and a lot of them went on, the sons of railroad workers, to fight in World War II. Uh, this is an individual born in a railroad boxcar, and he fought on the USS Farragut in World War II. Uh, this photograph from 1943, and he served on that ship. And you have uh, someone from Galesburg who, uh, who from a boxcar, and he actually saw service in the Air Force uh, <clears throat> as, a, as a gunner. Uh, you have this individual from Wellington, Kansas, who was uh, part of the D-Day invasion. So these are all children of, who were born in boxcars, of, of you know, American citizens of Mexican descent, individuals who died in World War II, who were born in, in boxcars. Uh, individuals uh, from that community, El Ranchito, the boxcar community, uh, children who were born there, uh, PFC uh, Diego uh, Ramos, again, American serviceman, 
who were born there and, and uh, uh, died in World War II. Uh, first class, Rita Luna from Sedgwick, Kansas. Sedgwick had a, a substantial uh, railroad boxcar community in that area, okay? And uh, Jesse Nila uh, served in World War II and got one of these letters from President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, condolences to the family for having served uh, their duty and, and dying in World War II. So that's what happened to some of these uh, individuals from the boxcars, as is it the duty of American citizens to be involved with that. So with that, that's the end. Ya se acabó, which means it's over, makes me want to cry. That's me in 1951 in the, in the backyard, and I'm crying because the presentation is over. I want to thank everyone.